if you buy the video, if you if the video is accurate, then the timeline uh, is very devastating to the defense uh, because it's just too close together. Welcome to the global phenomenon, Surviving the Survivor, where we're all just trying to survive in a rough world. What's up, SDS Nation, and welcome to another episode of Surviving the Survivor, the podcast that promises to bring you the best guests in all of true crime. It is week three, as you all know, of the double murder trial of embattled former attorney Alec Murdoch. Murdoch, of course, is accused of killing his wife and youngest son, Maggie and Paul, at the family's Carlton County property back in June of 2021. And that, my friends, is just a fraction of the story. We don't joke around when we say best guest. You're in for a treat today of a veteran South Carolina criminal defense attorney and well-known TV personality and attorney. Starting off our roster here tonight, Jack B. Swirling is an active Columbia, South Carolina criminal attorney, litigator, writer, and lecturer. He's been doing it since 1973 four years after I was uh, born, so a (laughs) while. Uh, He was named a South Carolina super lawyer, a top 10 super lawyer in criminal defense, and he's one of only 70 South Carolina Carolina lawyers who are fellows in the American College of Trial Lawyers. And very interestingly, especially for this show, he he was a partner in the law firm of Swirling, Harputlian, and McCulloch. And uh, that name, Harputlian, probably rings a bell since he's the defense attorney. And you'll also notice Swirling's name came before Dick Harputlian's name. So we'll ask him about Dick in a moment. The other guy, you've seen his mug on TV, and that's why you can't see it here, but you'll hear his voice. Danny Savayos is an NBC News and MSNBC legal analyst appearing on shows across the network to discuss legal issues in the news. He was formerly a legal analyst at CNN, HLN, and True TV, where he guest hosted and anchored uh, in session on Court TV and True TV and guest hosted Primetime Justice on HLN. Uh, Quick programming notes. Please follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. We are at Podcast STS. You can also listen to us anywhere you find podcasts. And as both my seven and eight-year-old daughters say, please hit that subscribe button and the like button. It gets the algorithm chugging. Um, Mr. Swirling, Counselor Swirling to you, we got some high drama just before noon on Monday. Uh, Judge Newman declared he was going to have a decision on whether or not he was going to admit financial crimes evidence. And uh, he came back uh, shortly before the afternoon break and decided he was going to grant the motion to admit the financial crimes evidence. And I will quote Judge Newman here. He said, I find that the jury is entitled to consider whether the apparent desperation of Mr. Murdoch because of his dire financial situation, the threat of being exposed for committing the crimes for which he was later charged with resulted in the commission of the alleged crimes. How big a win, in your estimation, Mr. Swirling, is it that these financial crimes are being admitted into evidence, a win for the state, that is? Well, I think it is a win for the state. Uh, Of course, now they're going to have to go ahead and prove that there's some connection between the financial crimes and the murder of the uh, wife and of the son. But the judge did let in the evidence of the financial crimes. He let in actually all of it. Uh, He cited his opinion uh, from the bench this morning. Uh, And I know the judge is a well-reasoned opinion. He's obviously a very bright judge. uh, But as I understand, he let it in under what we call Rule 404, uh, which is uniform in all the states and federal court. It basically is other act evidence, uh, and it's used in this case to prove motive, uh, even motive, even though motive is not an element of the crime of murder. But the judge said that by proving murder, motive, I'm sorry, by proving motive, that he was also allowing them to prove malice, which is a element of the crime of murder. And uh, Danny, to you, we had uh, the prosecutors on from the prosecutors podcast, Alice and Brett, who do a phenomenal job. Also, they went to Yale and Harvard, respectively, so they are no dummies. 
Uh, they said that 404B would uh, be what the judge would use here uh, to admit um, th these financial crimes uh, into evidence. Can you explain what 404B is a little bit? And uh, in your opinion, how big a win is this for the state? Let me start with, to the extent anything I say is different from Jack Swirling, listen to Jack Swirling over me because he knows. <clears throat> I am, you heard that introduction. It took two or three minutes to get through all of his accomplishments. So listen, here's my take. Uh, but let's start at the beginning. 404B evidence is the bane of criminal defense lawyers' existence. And I'll tell you why. Jack got into it a little bit. You start with a general rule. Character evidence is not admissible. What is character evidence? It's evidence of your character and often evidence of your prior bad acts. Those are the most devastating. So, for example, if we were to introduce evidence uh, that you cheated in a bake sale in middle school, that would be totally, it may be true, but it would be totally prejudicial on the issue of whether or not you were a murderer. But uh, so the general rule is in a criminal case, thou shalt never introduce evidence of bad character. But like many rules, like the hearsay rule, for example, it is a rule riddled with exceptions. And those exceptions are usually bad for the defense. Here's what I mean. I just got 404 bead in a case not too long ago, and it's pretty devastating. So here's the rule. And the reason uh, why many people may be wondering, and I got to tell you, I don't know if Jack feels this way too. This issue with the financial records reads like a complex law school exam because it's it's got a lot of tricky issues. But the question arises, why in the world was this hearing held outside of the jury's ears? Why didn't they do this at the beginning of the case? Well, the answer is that the defense apparently did something that is uh, the worst thing a defense attorney can hear during trial, which is open the door. They, they basically opened the door when they made a kind of character argument about, uh, about the defendant. And the rule is this. Character evidence doesn't come in unless the defense is allowed to introduce good character. But once they do, that opens the door and the, the prosecution can back up the dump truck and dump all kinds of bad character. And that's why this hearing happened. And I've opened the door a few times myself. It's the worst feeling that a defense attorney can have. I don't know if Jack agrees with me. And I don't always agree that I did open the door, but it's up to the judge. And I feel like, uh, uh, you know, most of the time this kind of evidence is bad for the defense. So now this, this hearing is about whether or not they could introduce the financial crimes evidence. And I got to tell you, I rather differ with almost everybody out there. And here's my take. I think the prosecution made a mistake even trying to introduce these financial crimes, but I can forgive them because a prosecutor has to prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt. And for that reason, they often engage in what's called overkill. They dump all kinds of evidence. They, they're overzealous in getting evidence in that is bad for the defense. But hear me out on this theory. By introducing the financial crimes evidence, their theory of motive, and Jack told us about motive, is that the defendant here his, had these financial crimes, his life was falling apart, and in order to garner sympathy, he murdered his wife and son. I think that's not a credible motive. It might be true. It might be totally true, but you're asking the jurors to believe that of all the people who get into financial trouble, who commit financial crimes, I've never heard of someone trying to get sympathy by killing their wife and child. So I rather think this was a bad, this is a win the prosecution didn't need, and maybe they don't want. What if they had just proceeded with their case on the theory of all the circumstantial evidence that they have? Basically, they've got evidence saying the only other person there at the time of the killing was the defendant. So uh, does the prosecution do better by just ignoring this financial crimes evidence because this motive is too wacky that a jury might reject it? But again, I don't blame prosecutors because they have to kind of engage in overkill because they have to prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt. The defense can just sit back and say, nope, you didn't meet your burden. So I think this is a thorny issue. I'm in the minority. In fact, I'm a minority of one. I think everybody else thinks this is a win for the prosecution. Uh, I, I tend to not think so. I think that uh, they are going to regret introducing this evidence because all it takes is one or two jurors. That's their theory. Uh, remember, the prosecution doesn't need to introduce motive. You, while it's true, juries want to hear motive. I think they, they often want an explanation. Uh, Jack's absolutely right. It's not an essential element. But prosecutors, in their uh, you know, overzealous attempt to, get, to win, 
will shove in all the evidence they can. But look, I think probably I'll end up being wrong about this, but it's something that's been nagging me that I think the prosecution would have been done better to just avoid. But, you know, that being said, some of the evidence of his shenanigans makes him look like a terrible person. And just my last note on 404B evidence. You know, the rule is character evidence doesn't come in, but the prosecution can admit it if they call it something else. Now, remember, I'm a biased defense attorney, but, you know, so often, and I'm sure this has happened to Jack, where the prosecution wants to introduce evidence of all these bad things that the defendant did in the past that they're not allowed to, but instead they say, well, what if we just called it motive evidence? Or what if we called it uh, absence of mistake evidence? So, look, I I've been burned by 404B evidence quite a bit. Uh, I think it's a real problem for defendants. But ultimately, in the end, this could possibly be a boon for the defense. And Jack, uh, Danny brings up a, a really interesting point. I mean, look at the worst of the worst. Uh, Bernie Madoff, for example, did not shoot his wife, did not shoot his son to divert blame. That has been a thorn in the prosec prosecution side, this motive. Um, how problematic, in your opinion, is it that they're going with this motive of basically trying to get empathy and divert attention. Interestingly, some of the testimony reflected uh, today kind of supports that. We'll get into that in a moment. But uh, just your take in general about this m financial motive as a reason to kill uh, his wife and also his uh, son. Well, I, I agree with Danny. And, and even though it is a win for the prosecution, they've won their motion. But now they got to deal with it. And uh, I agree with what Danny said. I believe that this evidence that they're bringing in about financial crimes uh, as a reason to go ahead and deflect uh, from his crimes, uh, as far as the jury is concerned, that's what they're trying to do. I think they're also trying to show he's got bad character uh, and he's a bad guy. Uh, and the interesting thing was that I during jury selection, most of the people in Colleton County, and it's a small county, never even heard of the case, which... Uh, I, I have to look at that with a, you know, smile uh, because I don't know how they would not have heard about it. But I think uh, introducing financial evidence that someone went ahead and killed their wife and then killed their son with, with no apparent financial gain possible, then it's preposterous. I, I don't think that, that that does not pass the smell test for me. Uh, that is the one thing in this case right now that I have a reasonable doubt about. Uh, there is no, you know, people... Danny's handled cases, and I'm, I've handled many cases where husband and wives have killed each other, hurt each other. Uh, you can understand those kinds of things because there's a fine line between love and hate. And when people get riled up, uh, they, that can happen. And I've had it happen many times. But to go ahead and take that other step and kill your son with a shotgun uh, and blow his head off and spill his brains all over the ground, I don't buy it. I just don't buy that as a reason to go ahead and get into this evidence and what, and I'm not sure how uh, the team is going to, the defense team is going to play it, but it would be something that I would be arguing about the, how preposterous it is that they're going ahead and trying to offer this as some sort of motive. And that, that is what uh, is hanging up a, a lot of people and we'll see if it ultimately uh, hangs this jury. Um, Jack, I'd be remiss if, if I didn't ask, uh, do you know Alec Murdoch from all your years? And uh, let's begin there because I want to ask you about Dick Harputlian too. Oh, please don't ask me about him. I, I, <laughs> uh, well, I do know the Murdochs. Uh, they are uh, a very powerful family, influential family down in that uh, judicial circuit. Um, and they're into, you know, their law firm was the biggest in that area, the most prosperous uh, law firm in the area. Uh, it goes back three generations uh, where the family was uh, prosecutors in that judicial circuit, going all the way back to the grandfather and who I ran into 50 something years ago. And he was a tough guy. Uh, the father of Alec is somebody that is a contemporary of mine. Uh, and I tried cases with him back in the in the early 80s when he was the prosecutor. Uh, so it, it's a very influential, powerful family. Uh, they're not only into the law, but I mean, they have huge real estate holdings and uh, they're very generous, very philanthropic. So uh, this is something that they're going to have to convince the jury beyond a reasonable doubt that there was a reason why Alec uh, would have gone ahead and killed his wife and then killed his son.
Uh, um, Danny, apologies, apologies to you in advance because uh, I've got uh, a guy here who knows South Carolina law like no one else. So let me just pick his brain for a couple more minutes here, and we'll we'll get right back to you as well. Um, Dick Harputlian, obviously you know him well. Your name came ahead of his on the marquee, so to speak. Um, what kind of defense lawyer is he? What kind of friend is he? Is he a friend? Well, he's he's a very close friend. And we, uh, we went to Clemson together back in the mid-60s. So we've known each other like some 57 years. Uh, and we still are close. I had lunch with him yesterday. We are going to break uh, this trial with Joe McCullough, who's also down there, sitting there with that beautiful gray hair, uh, like on the third row. Uh, he's getting some good uh, photo ops. Uh, but I know them, I know them well. Uh, Dick and I practiced. We tried cases against each other when we got out of law school. Uh, he was a deputy solicitor here in Richland County, where I, where we are. Uh, and then we tried a very serious uh, serial killer case, uh, the largest mass murder in the history of South Carolina, a guy named Pee Wee Gaskins. Dick prosecuted the case. Uh, I defended the case. It was an eight-week trial, and Gaskins got the death penalty. And Harpulian always brags about beating me in that case, but I told him, I tell him all the time a monkey could have won that case, uh, which was... <laughs> gets a smile out of him. But uh, he's he's very sharp, very bright. He has a sharp mind, and he also has a very sharp tongue. Uh, and you have probably heard him during the course of this trial. I mean, he takes no prisons. Uh, and he will go, I've always said from the beginning of the trial, that his strategy is going to be to keep the state uh, off its mark, uh, to keep throwing things at them, to try and get them off their scripted uh, plan here in this case. Uh, how they plan on trying the case. And he'll do it. He's effective at it. And uh, as I said, I've tried cases against him, so I know very well. Uh, but I've also tried cases with him, and he's very sharp, very sharp mind, very sharp tongue. Does that sharp tongue put him in danger of turning off jurors, though? No, he's got a way. I, somehow or another, Dick can go ahead and say things uh, in politics and in the law that he gets away with that I would never get away with. <laughs> and... Uh... You know, you just talked about this uh, serial killer case. Has anything um, in your time in South Carolina, in terms of your legal history as an attorney, has anything come close to the magnitude of this trial? Well, I think the Gaskins case did. I mean, it was an eight week trial and he was he had killed uh, allegedly 13 people uh, and they were seeking the death penalty. He killed somebody on death row, by the way. Uh, he took a contract to kill an individual on death row and blew his head off. With a C with C four explosives, so I got uh, I was rewarded to go ahead and get appointed to that case and try the case for eight weeks. Uh, by the way, I got paid seven hundred fifty dollars by the state for doing that. So, uh, <laughs> so Danny, uh, back to you now. Uh, there was some interesting testimony on Monday from Mark Tinsley, who actually is an attorney representing the family of Mallory Beach. Uh, she was uh, the young woman killed in the in the boating accident. And I thought this was interesting, uh, especially in light of your comments um, about trying to keep the financial crimes uh, out of uh, this case, which is no longer happening as it was admitted into evidence on Monday. But Mark Tinsley said that Alec Murdoch told him he was broke and had no money to pay the Beach family. Uh, Tinsley went on to say he didn't believe Alec because of the number of lawsuits he thought Alec was settling. So he filed a motion to compel in October 2020 um, and basically said, I know uh, that he's actively making money, so there's no way he's broke. Um, but then went on to say, and this is what I think is interesting, Danny, Tinsley said after Maggie and Paul were killed, he considered ending the boat crash lawsuit against Alex because he thought that a jury would have never ruled against Alex which kind of goes to the point of what the prosecution is saying, that he he killed his wife and son to gain empathy. In this case, um, he was saying that he couldn't have filed this lawsuit regarding the boat accident for that very reason. The jury never would have uh, awarded uh, the client. What do you make of that? Well, here's my, my take on this. I think I, I'm almost of two minds because... I think this motive, this financial crime motive to kill the, the wife and son is something the jury wouldn't accept. But I'm not so sure 
I wouldn't accept it for this defendant. I'm sure Jack has had this experience that, you know, sometimes if you've ever met a habitual liar and criminal defense attorneys, our lives are chock full of habitual liars. Uh, if you meet someone who is a sociopath and willing to say or do anything to get what they want, uh, then you know that these are people that really wouldn't have much of a problem with lying to you and they just as soon lie to you as they might stab you in the back, figuratively and literally. So, I mean, I don't think the prosecution is that far off with this theory. I just don't know that it's something that this jury would accept for the reason that the jury is normal people and normal people would never do that. Uh, now, a uh, you know, it, out does is it possible that Murdoch is this sociopath, habitual liar who would do anything uh, to to deal with his money problems? I mean, I do think it's it's compelling evidence that here's a guy who is, and I'm, I'm constantly reminded, sorry to make a movie reference, and I hate doing that, but there's an epic movie, Fargo, that really is about this guy who's just got so many scams going, and they're all imploding on him. And this, he reminds me of Murdoch. And he's a guy who ends up, you know, committing murder, essentially, or uh, kidnapping uh, that results in a death to, to try and get out of this trouble. So, I mean, I think those people are out there, even though that was a fictionalized movie. I, I think folks like that are out there. And I think the prosecution may be on to something. I just don't think it's going to necessarily be successful because jurors are normal people and they just aren't ready to believe that. But I, I still think it's very compelling when you heard testimony. And I wonder if Jack knows the, you know, the attorney who testified, who was uh, Murdoch's, he called him his best friend. There he is weeping on the stand. Very effective testimony. Uh, again, but it's testimony that goes to Murdoch as a sociopath. And in a way, that sounds like character evidence to me, but okay, it comes in. But I mean, you know, the jury's getting a whole lot of evidence about Murdoch being a terrible person. I, I don't know. I mean, on the circumstantial evidence alone, and I've gotten the same question from about 50 different folks, you know, when I do shows here at NBC, and it's, hey, this is just a circumstantial evidence case. Is that strong? And the answer is, yeah, circumstantial evidence is often stronger than direct evidence, which is really just an eyewitness saying, I saw Professor Plum kill Mr. Body in the library. And that is eyewitness testimony, which is notoriously unreliable. Uh, our memories are not so great. So circumstantial evidence cases are very powerful evidence cases. But I think the defense has a lot of good strategy here. I mean, I think the idea, I, I thought it was brilliant to, you know, to explain away the shell casings found on the property with, hey, we shoot guns around here. There's lots of shell casings. They're everywhere. I thought that was very compelling. And I think folks in, in, uh, in that part of the world, maybe they're, you know, statistically, you have some more gun, owner, more gun owners than you would here in New York City. And they'd be more inclined to understand that. They would understand that testimony. So, you know, look, I put this on the spectrum. You know, on one end of the spectrum, you have the Idaho uh, stabbing uh, case in which I think that defendant should race to enter a plea. And on the other end of the spectrum, you have the Alec Baldwin uh, misdemeanor, or excuse me, a manslaughter case, which I think he should fight tooth and nail, and I believe he'll win. Murdoch is somewhere in the middle. I'm not ruling out an acquittal on this case. Uh, the defense has done a fine job so far, and I really think, that the prosecution may have gotten themselves into a hole. I think they, you know, beware, you may get what you ask for. And I think this financial crime uh, evidence might be a sticky point for them. I can almost picture closing argument where the attorney will stand before the jury, the defense attorney, and say, essentially, the prosecution's theory of this case is that a man who had financial problems would kill his wife and son to get sympathy. That makes no sense. It's insane. Uh, and so I, I, I just see that coming. And all it takes is a couple jurors to buy into that. Uh, Jack, I'm a recovering news network news correspondent, so I've got to ask you, um, when you had lunch, and you're going to tell me to buzz off, but I'm going to ask anyway, but when you did have lunch with Dick yesterday, did he give you any indication of uh, how he thought the trial was going so far and if he had the edge? Well, no, he didn't say he had the edge, but he thought it was going as he thought it would be. Uh, he thought they were in the place where they, he thought they would be at the beginning of the trial. So, uh, and we just intentionally, since I was, I'm doing some commentating for some of the newspapers here and, and giving my, my view of things, uh, we kind of intentionally did not go into the details of the case because I really don't want to know those and then come across as bias and, uh, you know, having some information that uh, may, may uh, 
sort of color my uh, opinions in the case. Understood. So back to um, this attorney who was on the stand today who uh, represented Mallory Beach. Um, this is a direct quote. Pretty quickly, I recognized that the case against Alec, if he were a victim of some vigilante, would in fact be over, uh, Tinsley said. So if Alec had been victimized by a vigilante, nobody would have brought a verdict back against Alex. And I had other defendants in the case, so I would have ended the case against Alec. But um, once again, Jack, to you, in a weird roundabout way, I think this is proving the point to some degree that the prosecution is trying to make about all these financial crimes catching up with him, that he was looking for some empathy or sympathy. Right here, you see Tinsley saying, I, I wouldn't have been able to bring this against him because I don't think uh, the jurors would have would have bought it. They would have been too essentially heartbroken for, for Alec. Is that how you read it or am I totally off here? No, I, you you may be right as it, the way you're assessing it, but I, I don't I don't feel that way. I believe that uh, the situation with Alec and whether or not this would create sympathy and the jury would not find him guilty uh, in this case or any other case, I just don't think uh, it makes a lot of sense. And I think Danny would agree that uh, juries have to find that a verdict or the evidence makes some sense. And what does not make sense here is that if, first of all, there's no financial gain at all. I mean, Alec gets nothing out of this case because of killing his wife or his son. There's there's nothing to get. So he can't pay off any of the debts. He can't uh, offer any restitution to anybody if he if he won uh, and whatever he was going to win. But there, there was nothing to get. There's no pot of gold there at the end. So the only reason could possibly be what the state is alleging, that he was going to get some sympathy and they were concerned about that. I, I just don't buy that. I, I don't believe that... Uh, I don't believe a jury in this case is going to find that that makes sense. I think they're going to come back and they're going to think what I'm thinking, that maybe he could kill his wife in the heat of passion uh, after a fight or an argument, but he's not going to kill his son. I mean, that just takes it one step far beyond what anybody I think is reasonable. And especially in light of the sled agent's testimony, um, whose name is slipping my mind now, who essentially said, and it's graphic, but who said Paul's brain was down by his ankles. I mean, you hear that, you think of a father. I'm the father of two young girls and a young son. Um, can't imagine it. Um, just the father and son are close, too. I mean, they, uh, there's no evidence that there was any animosity between the father and son. Uh, everybody has that I'm aware of says they were very close. I mean, how could you possibly do that to your son uh, and to just go ahead and deflect and create some kind of sympathy. I just don't, uh, it doesn't make sense to me. And I think verdicts have to make sense. Every week we have a uh, detective Phil Waters on from the Houston PD retired. He uh, investigated over 400 homicides. He always says that any person is capable of committing the most horrific crime given the right situation. Um, but I don't know that that is the right situation to commit that god awful crime. Well, um, there would Danny, have to be something in his, if I could inject one, there would sure. have to be something in his background uh, that would corroborate that or would, would lead toward that. Like you said, he may be a sociopath, but there's, there's really nothing that I'm aware of that has come out or is going to come out uh, that says he's a sociopath, except the fact that he stole from his partners. He lied, I and mean, he's a liar. There's no question about it, he's a liar. But I'm not aware of anything else that would indicate he's a sociopath, uh, where somebody would have no remorse or have no problem, uh, you know, killing somebody and, and not think about it twice. So I, I just don't know that that's there. So we also heard on Monday from a woman named Michelle Shelley Smith, um, and she is Alec Murdoch's, or I guess currently also Alec Murdoch's mother's caregiver. Um, and she testified in the days after Paul and Maggie were killed. Alec told her that he had been at his mom's house for 30 to 40 minutes that night. However, uh, Shelly Smith says he was actually not at the home for that long uh, and said that the conversation they had upset her and she calls her brother to tell him about it. She was crying th during this testimony and went on to say, they were a good family, and I love working there, and I'm sorry all this happened. 
Um, Danny, I know you're a busy guy. You've got your own law firm and you're doing all this analysis for uh, NBC. Did you, did you happen to catch that testimony? And what did you make? A, very, a little bit of it. Yes, a little bit of it. And, and your thoughts you, on that bit of it? You know, again, I, I think the key for the prosecution, some of the, some of the best evidence they've had is that they've demonstrated that Alec Murdoch may not have been truthful when he said he wasn't there. Uh, then when he said he wasn't on the property at the time. But, you know, one, one of the things that is always remarkable is that defendants, especially defendants who may not be tech savvy, often don't realize uh, how much today our devices are tracking us and how much evidence is being generated just, you know, obviously we're being recorded here, but, you know, our phones are tracking us. When you walk around outside, there are all kinds of cameras probably tracking you. And, and really, the, Alec Murdoch, if he is convicted, his undoing might be the Snapchat video that was introduced. Something that I guarantee you, if Murdoch is guilty, he never dreamed that he would be, that Snapchat video would be something that would be damning to him. Uh, you just can't, I, I don't know that, uh, that you can ever have another Zodiac killer, someone who kills and disappears into the ether and we never find them. I don't know that that's possible anymore with modern technology. I think the uh, state's evidence uh, of the technological evidence of where he was, uh, and that includes the cell phone evidence that we heard, the text messages or the, the cell phone data that might have been deleted. I think that goes a long way to, uh, to refuting where Alec was and where he was at that time of the murder. So I think I think that's really problematic for the defendant as well. But uh, uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, again, we're we're hearing the prosecution's case. This is all the state show right now. Uh, and one other thing I would add that was interesting is that the defense cross examined. I'm getting into the ballistics expert briefly. The defense cross examined the ballistics expert. In my mind, they seem to challenge the underlying science, which may signal to me that they're not planning on calling their own expert because you can't really. Uh, you can't really, uh, you know, disparage the science and then call your own expert in the science. So I thought, thought that was very interesting, and it kind of gave us a slight reveal into what the defense may be planning. Uh, but again, you know, it, it's all the prosecution show right now. And are they engaging in some overkill? Maybe, but the way the system is set up, they kind of have to so they can be forgiven for that. But that can also be a boon to the defense is that they engage in overkill and it gives the defense a lot to chop down, especially if it's something they didn't need in the first place. And so, Jack, uh, Danny led us into this. I want to get back to uh, Shelly, but uh, since he brought up the Snapchat video, there's two videos. Everyone gets them confused as to which one's actually the Snapchat and which one's not. Uh, but the video, which I call the dog tail video, that was basically taken at 848, considering the prosecution uh, puts the death at 8.50 that night. On that video at 8.48 from the kennels, you can hear, clearly hear, um, according to two witnesses, Alec Murdoch's voice. How damning is that going to be uh, when it's all said and done? Well, I think that's the most problematic problem for the uh, state. Uh, I mean, for the defense, uh, overcoming that timeline. Uh, the it just the timeline is is really I think very important in this case, and I think the defense is going to have to come forward and explain why that timeline doesn't work. Because as you said, he is on the video. Uh, I think uh, Paul's friend uh, identified his voice uh, as being as standing there and, and talking at that time. But if you buy the video, if you if the video is accurate, then the timeline uh, is very devastating to the defense uh, because it just too close together. Uh, the right. death and then him being on the video sort of disputes his alibi. Not and sort Jack, of, yeah, it does. Yeah. Jack, back to you on this. Um, Jim Griffin, who's uh, one of the defense attorneys uh, with this woman, Shelly, on the stand, who's the caretaker of Alec Murdoch's mother, uh, he folds a blue tarp in the courtroom and asks uh, Ms. Smith, if it resembles the blue something that he walked into the home with. That was a testimony. Uh, Smith answers that it did look like it. Uh, Griffin then asks uh, if Ms. Smith would mix up a blue tarp and a blue raincoat. Uh, she said she would not. Again, she was crying. Um, as I do before every show, I go to Twitter to see what the court of public opinion is saying. Mandy Matney, um, is the host of the Murdoch Murders podcast. 
and she tweeted out, and I'd love to get your take on this, um, the apparent fear we're seeing on the stand with witnesses like Shelly Smith is not normal witness nerves. Even with Alec behind bars, the Murdoch family still has power, and they're still sitting behind Alec while the witnesses testify. Do you agree with this tweet? Is the family so powerful? Do you, do you feel like she's fearful of repercussions, even as she's taking the witness stand? No, I mean, I, I, I cannot accept that theory. I mean, they are a powerful family. They're a very wealthy family. Uh, but I don't see where any of them are going to pose any danger to any of the witnesses in this case. I think what the problem is for some of these witnesses are they were close to the Murdochs. And they don't want to get on the witness stand and give testimony that in some way is going to incriminate him. Uh, she is one in case in particular. Chris Wilson, who was the friend who was the lawyer, uh, who talked last week about the financial issues. Um, and he didn't want to be there. Uh, several other people that have been called to testify, including friends, they just don't want to be there. I'm not sure they're afraid of the Murdochs. Uh, these are not people that normally would be people to be afraid of. They might be intimidated by them, but I don't know if they're afraid of getting hurt. Do you think this trial will change this perception of... Uh you know, kind of a good old boy network that runs parts of the state? Well, I think those days are over where there's a, a network that runs a part. I mean, when I started practicing law 50 years ago, I mean, we had very powerful politicians uh, that ran their counties or ran their circuit. Uh, my part, the individual who hired me right out of law school was a powerful state senator. Uh, and, he, you know, he they appointed, the senators appointed uh you know, the judges, our legislature elects the judges. So there were powerful cliques throughout the state. Uh, some of the senators uh, that were doing this were in office 20, 30 years, and they had a lot of people owe them things. Uh, but that's been broken up over the years. I mean, it's 50 years later, we do not have those kind of networks anymore. There are still influential people, but I don't think they have those powerful networks that they used to have. Can I jump in here? I, I'm so glad to hear Jack say this because he knows, you know, he has firsthand knowledge. But throughout this trial and before, all the all we've been sort of getting the vibe is they frame Murdoch as the emperor of the South. Like he is a like, like he owns he controls everything that goes on uh, like Napoleon. And I'm so glad to hear Jack say it because I just don't think people can do that anymore. Maybe there was a time when you could have somebody who controlled a county or an area. Uh, but I, I'm glad to hear that because I, I I was suspicious of that idea that, you know, these are people who are above the law. I mean, obviously, they're not above the law. Murdoch is a defendant in a criminal case, a high profile criminal case. He couldn't wiggle out of that one. Uh, so I'm really glad to hear Jack say that because I, I've been suspicious of the idea that this is a defendant that simply can't be convicted uh, in this county. I don't think that's it at all. I think uh, I don't think he has any tremendous advantage, except that it's complicated maybe to find people on the jury who hadn't heard of the case. But according to Jack, he's finding on juries that that isn't so hard. So I find that really interesting, too. Uh, and he would know. But uh, I'm so glad to hear Jack say that, because I just found it hard to believe that, that that somebody is that in modern times, that somebody is royalty and untouchable anywhere, whether it be, you know, uh, South Carolina, whether it be New York. Uh, and there are people out there who are a whole lot more influential than Murdoch. I'm sure. I'm sure Jack knows plenty of them. He described some of them, and and even they are not above the law. So I, I'm really glad to hear Jack say that. I could tell yeah, you maybe. that his grandfather, if I could interject something, his grandfather, Buster Murdoch, who was a solicitor when I first got out of law school, he was of that type. I mean, people, um, he was he was a great storyteller. He was a great uh, raconteur. He would sit and talk with you, but he was powerful, and people were afraid of him. He was a prosecutor, but he also was a lawyer who was allowed to practice civil law. So everybody in the county uh, went to him on civil cases because they knew he was also the prosecutor. Uh, and of course, that's not allowed anymore in South Carolina, but that was at that time. So uh, I think that generation uh, where his, uh, his grandfather uh, ruled that area, and he pretty much did rule that area, I think those days are over. And to Danny's point, I think, you know, there are a lot of factors, but one of them is technology. You just can't get away with what you used to be able to get away with because everyone's watching your every move. Um, 
There's one more bit of witness testimony from Monday. I just want to fly through. We'll take some uh, questions from the best audience in podcasting, STS Nation. And then we'll let these gentlemen get back to the business of being lawyers and TV stars, Danny. Um, but <laughs> Jamie Hall Jamie Hall took the stand today, uh, an evidence custodian uh, for the West Columbia PD, and um, basically talked about a freshly laundered shirt in her notes. Uh, she uh, took into evidence Alex's green cargo shorts, tennis shoes, and, and I laughed at this, a white Hanes t-shirt. Apparently couldn't afford anything more than a white Hanes t-shirt. Um, they were all collected. Um, and the shirt um, from Alec Murdoch, she said, smelled freshly laundered. Uh, and the quote goes, it smelled freshly laundered, which is not typical of the clothing in the lab, which usually smells slightly musky, when we get it, is that the kind of thing that a jury, Danny, says, oh, wait a minute, this guy was washing clothes trying to hide evidence? They might. I mean, this is uh, what I would call uh, a piece of evidence that could go either way. I could see a jury saying, hmm. And I think juries nowadays have been CSI'd out. They've all been conditioned by crime shows and they, they want there to be a, a plot twist and so I think that for that reason, it could be bad. But, you know, the jury could also say, hey, maybe this guy just wanted to change clothes because he knew there were police coming. They may be able to explain it away. But, yeah, I could see this this evidence going badly uh, for Murdoch. But I, I also think, again, this is the culture of prosecutorial overkill. They try to shove in absolutely every piece of evidence and make it be part of the puzzle. But when you do that, you know, that evidence could go either way. So I, I'm rather neutral on the clothes washing and clothes changing uh, piece of evidence. Uh, but again, you know, if that's the prosecution's, uh, if they feel that that's one of their strongest pieces, then maybe that's a signal that their case isn't quite as strong as they, they may think it is. I mean, I really think this case could go either way. I, I don't think this is a case that you should think is a, that anyone should think is a slam dunk for the prosecution. There are high profile cases out there that are slam dunks. Uh, ironically, the OJ case was a slam dunk for the prosecution, but they snatch victory out of their own, uh, uh, they snatch victory, uh, defeat rather out of victory. Uh, and by the way, I lo have long thought uh, about that case that that was a case of overkill. They held jurors hostage for a year and jammed evidence down their throats. And I, I wonder if, you know, a, a, a not guilty verdict was a bit of payback. So, I mean, that is a, a lesson in the dangers, I think, of prosecutorial overkill. And I think they need to be careful. You know, you have the financial evidence. Maybe the clothes washing evidence doesn't go their way with one or two jurors. Uh, and when they hash it out in the jury room and we'll never hear that, maybe that comes up. And all these years later, literally last week, I interviewed uh, Dr. Henry Lee, the famous forensic scientist, I asked him about OJ. He says he still wouldn't, you know, tell us whether he thought OJ committed the murders or not, but he did say uh, at the scene of uh, the crime, he found another footprint and uh, kind of left the audience hanging there. So, but that, that's interesting, Danny, that you think it could have been payback for all that time uh, spent as jurors. Um, just to round out this final bit of testimony, uh, Jack, um, this same sled agent noted small reddish brown stains on the Haynes t shirt but couldn't identify what they were from state. Obviously the implication is it's blood. Um, but again, South Carolina, and this was essentially a, a hunting lodge of sorts uh, where they lived. Um, you think jurors would just say it, it could be from myriad different things and not really focus on the fact that it could be a blood stain. I think the expert testimony either has or is going to be that it's not blood. That's mm -hmm. my understanding what the conclusions were, that they tested it several times and did not come back as blood uh, or human blood at any rate. As you're right, though, the, uh, this is a 1,700-acre estate uh, that the Murdaugh's owned. It was definitely for hunting and dogs. Uh, these folks down there were hunters. Uh, it's not unusual for them to be out there with their shotguns and their rifles and their pistols. So uh, you're going to find GSR, gunshot residue. Uh, it's going to be all over the place. It's going to be on clothes. It's going to be in the cars. It's going to be near the dog pen in the house. So you have to understand the, the backup here of what 
that area is like. And this is a hunt. I mean, they were hunting there. This is where people went to hunt. And they had big groups of people go there and hunt, too. On to some uh, viewer questions and comments. The first one from STS Nation's Demon Cat. Alec is one that never left the nest and did what daddy decided. Jack, I'll have you respond to this. Along with his family, they did what daddy Randolph said. Alec didn't have the guts or attitude to murder anyone. He's not the man's man. People think that people think he was still his daddy's boy. Uh, what do you make of this comment? Well, I don't see that uh, he was his daddy's boy. He was a very successful trial lawyer. Uh, their firm uh, were full of successful trial lawyers. I went to law school with a couple of them. Uh, Johnny Parker, who was a senior partner in that firm, is probably the best civil trial lawyer in the state. Uh, and Alec uh, made millions. I mean, the firm made millions and millions of dollars. Uh, some of the biggest verdicts down in that area of the state were from the Murdoch firm. So I, I just don't accept it. He did what Daddy told him, and he didn't have his own uh, free spirit to do what he wanted to do. Jack, we had um, Kim Varner and his son Grant Varner on. Do you know Kim? I know the name. I can't. I, I, uh, I can't say I know him right now, but I know the name. He's been practicing law for since '79, so he's a criminal defense attorney. He said, Down in that area, in that area, I want to say he's in Greenville. That's okay. where I think well, he is. Yeah, um, yeah, I think in Greenville. But he said this has all the makings of a cartel hit, which sounds like something a criminal defense attorney would say. Is that something that is that something you would raise potentially if you were uh, in Dick Harpoolian's shoes? Well, uh, Dick's shoes are much smaller than mine. Uh, just, <laughs> I wore a 13, so he, I think he's probably down to a 10. But, I, I, you know, initially when this case first happened and with the boating accident the way it was and the hostility and you know, the, the, people, the way people felt about the boating accident and the way Paul and the rest of them uh, and the other kids involved in it were acting, uh, it was very likely that, uh, and I think a lot of people thought it could have been a hit a revenge kind of uh, killing. Uh, but I think that, I don't know that many people anymore are believing that. Uh, I think there's a lot of other evidence in the case and I, I'm not aware of any evidence that there's a hit or was a hit, but that was talked about in the beginning quite a bit. Yeah, with all his drug problems. Um, Danny, on to you here from Sanjo. I think he premeditated this. He had the guns there and made it look like an ambush by two people, Paul first. Maggie ran. He grabbed the other gun. This makes me so sad for these lost people. Um, but Danny, you got to follow the evidence, right? Um, is it possible to pre prove in this court of law that Alec not only committed these crimes, but did it with premeditation? Sure, it's possible, but I don't know how much evidence of premeditation we've heard so far. Uh, and if the prosecution doesn't have that, then if I'm on the defense, I'm making that argument uh, in closing. If they come to the table with no real evidence of premeditation, what I think they're trying to do is end run around premeditation by bringing in this bad character evidence. They basically say, hey, the premeditation is evident from this theory of ours that he killed them in order to distract from all of his financial problems. Again, I just keep rolling that around in my head and I think, well, that wouldn't even slow down any of these. I mean, maybe what they would, somebody wait to serve you with a subpoena for two or three days to let you get over your bereavement. I mean, how much is that going to delay uh, legal action against you or even criminal action against you for your financial crimes? So I think the prosecution's trying to do an end run and bring in this uh, this mode of evidence as a kind of evidence of premeditation. But I do think that's a, a challenge for prosecutors, but it's a challenge in all murders where you don't really, you know, where the only other witnesses are the victims and they're not around to tell. And uh, premeditation can be tough to prove. But I think what the prosecution's theory is, is that, hey, you know, he, he uh, uh, planned this out and part of the planning was using these two different guns. And the reason he did that it's because he's a lawyer, he's a smart guy, and he did this to throw up the scent. So there, there's a piece of premeditation right there. It might work. I don't think, I think no juror will have any problem believing, if they believe Murdoch is guilty, 
uh, believing that he used two guns to evade capture. I, I don't think that's a big stretch. I think that 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 was not, if that's what he did, use two firearms uh, because he thought it would be automatic, reasonable doubt that there were two killers, then I think that was ill-advised because I think that's an easy uh, an easy thing for the jury to accept that somebody would do that to throw off the set. Now, what I'm interested about, maybe this won't happen, is to what extent the defense is planning to use uh, what I call, and I wonder if this phrase is, or this term has gotten down to where Jack practices, but it's called SODI, S-O-D-D-I, some other dude did it. Uh, and this is, you know, this is something, and but I didn't make this up, but this is something I heard, you know, early on, I've heard it in different jurisdictions where I practice. And uh, the idea is, are they going to point the finger at someone else? And are they going to develop that theory? Because you can really go two ways with this. You can either you can either suggest some other dude did it at the end without putting on any evidence and, and really just point to sloppiness in the, in the investigation and, and the possibility that some other bad guy is out there. Or you can try to prove that alternate theory and actually point at a particular person or a theory of that person, You know, whether it be a cartel hit or something like that. So I'm interested to see if the defense is holding on to this, if they plan on, uh, on revealing this through the defense phase. Although I don't know how much surprise there would be if they had to disclose their witness list. But, you know, we may see some of that. In a way, it might be really the only defense that Murdoch could ever have, other than just sitting back and saying they didn't prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. You know, when you have a really tough case, and, you know, I, it's funny, uh, Jack talked about court-appointed cases. I've had plenty of court-appointed cases, and those are often the toughest cases. Uh, and, uh, and when you have the toughest of tough cases, sometimes all you can do is sit back on reasonable doubt, you know, and just talk about reasonable doubt and say they didn't prove it. That may be what, you know, the Murdoch defense team is planning, but I'd rather think they're a little more uh, strategic and a little more, um, they've got a lot more in mind. So we may see... Uh, some other dude did it theory here, whether they'll go out and try and point to a particular person, cartel members, whatever, uh, remains to be seen. But, you know, you don't always need to do that, but it's a lot, a lot more helpful to try and prove an alternate theory uh, in the defense phase. So I'm curious to see what they do in the defense phase. But if I were to play the odds statistically, more often than not, the defense calls a lot fewer witnesses and just hangs back and takes advantage of that, uh, the beyond a reasonable doubt standard and the presumption of innocence. That's, that's what you end up doing in a lot of these really tough cases. But I don't know that the defense sees this as a really tough case. And I don't know that I see it that way yet either. Very interesting. Uh, Dr. Silkman writes, we'll take a couple more comments and wrap this bad boy up. Um, Jack, this one's for you. Um, we talked about it briefly. It's difficult to comprehend how after a mere five minutes after the Snapchat video, which is the dog tail video at the dog kennel in which Alec Murdoch's voice was identified, both Maggie and Paul were mercilessly executed at close range. Where was Alec Murdoch during that crucial time frame? Killer or killers at large or a killer known to the victims? Question mark. Um, how do you think? Dick gets around this because this, as you said, seems to be the biggest lingering problem for him right now. Well, and I do think it's a problem. And I guess the question is going to be whether or not Alex gets on the witness stand and testifies as if it, in his own defense. Uh, someone, some, something has to be offered to go ahead and explain that timeline to spread the timeline and to offer another alternative as to where Alec was or how he would have been able to do all of that. And I think the big question uh, for the defense is to keep attacking that timeline that it it's not possible that he could have done everything that they said he did within the time frame that they've been able to prove. Uh, but that may be a, maybe require Alec to go ahead and testify and, and establish certain things that uh, spread that timeline out. Interesting you say, it in. It's close interesting it you in. say that because uh, we had the prosecutors, as I mentioned on the podcast, they think that Alec may take the stand in this case. Obviously, time will tell. Um, Kelly Bruno writes, whether the jury can take notes varies region to region, but this jury is not allowed to take any notes, not even take them and hand them in at the end of the day. Very surprised when I heard that. There's been a lot of discussion about this. Um, Jack, is that commonplace in South Carolina jury trials where they cannot take notes? And... Uh, how difficult is that on jurors to have to try to retain everything in their mind? 
Well, it is difficult, and it's really in the judge's discretion. I've tried cases where they've been allowed to take notes, and I've tried cases where they have not been allowed to take uh, notes. So it really just comes down to what's in the judge's discretion. Uh, and in this case, the judge decided not to allow them to take notes. But when they do take notes, they have to gather the notes up every night and not let the uh, let them stay in the jurors' hands. Uh, and they have to be retrieved at the end of the day and given back in the morning. And my final uh, STS Nation comment here in my favor from Kerry Allen. Surviving the Survivor has me actually starting to like lawyers. Exclamation mark. Uh, Danny, any response to that? Do most people <laughs> love you or hate you on TV? Uh, you know, look, he here's the thing. If social media is any indication, I am both too far left and too far right at the same time. And, uh, and so the bottom line is, uh, I, you know, social media doesn't give you a really good idea of anything. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I'm not really sure. I don't know that folks have the general dislike for lawyers. I, I, I know that's a, uh, a rap that lawyers get, but you know, I, I, I think a lot of folks appreciate what we do, even in modern times, criminal defense attorneys. I think folks appreciate that we, you know, we are the, uh, we are the safeguards of the Republic. We, you know, we do a job. We, there's nothing scarier and I think uh, more honorable than standing up uh, for the defense when you have the array, the, the might of the government arrayed against you. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, look, I, I, people are totally entitled to their opinion, especially if they've had bad experiences with lawyers. I get it. Like any profession, there are a lot of good lawyers and a lot of really, really bad ones out there. Uh, I'm just shooting for fair to middling myself. That's about, you know, what I'm hoping, not, hoping I am. So <laughs> I'm hoping for the best there. But uh, I guess that's my comment. I know that, uh, you know, hopefully, I think a positive thing is any show like yours that paints uh, attorneys in a uh, better light. That's a positive thing. Hey, I'm doing something good. Danny Savios is so handsome, we asked him not to appear on video so he wouldn't <laughs> take the uh, limelight away from Jack and myself. He also happens to be an NBC News and MSNBC legal analyst. You've seen him there. You've seen him on CNN. You've seen him everywhere. He's also co-founder of Savios and Wong, in case you need a Philadelphia area criminal defense and civil litigation law firm. Danny, does this end in acquittal, hung jury, or conviction? And where do we go here in the next couple of days? There are two facts. One, I make a lot of predictions, and two, they are almost never correct. <laughs> so uh, if I go down on record making a prediction, nobody should go to Vegas and bet. I still think the edge goes to the prosecution here, but I won't be surprised uh, if there's an acquittal. I think the defense is doing a great job. And I guess I, would, uh, I do want to add thank you very much for having me, and it's an honor to be on with Jack and you both. Uh, really appreciate it. I don't know about me, but definitely with definitely with Jack. Jack, definitely with Jack okay. and Jack B. Swirling is still an active Columbia, South Carolina, criminal uh, defense attorney, litigator, writer and lecturer. He started back in 1973. He's been on TV cumulatively way more than Danny Savios. I have no doubt about that. He's a super lawyer, top 10 uh, in the state and one of only 70 South Carolina lawyers who are fellows in the American College of Trial Lawyers. And he's also a former partner of Dick Harputlian. But something tells me that Swirling not only can hang with the best like Dick, but can outdo them uh, with his size 13 shoes. Same question to you, Jack. Does this end in acquittal, a hung jury, a conviction? And what are you expecting over the coming weeks? Well, I think from what I understand, we got about two more weeks of trial. Uh, that's what I've been told. Uh, that's from some people on the inside who have a good idea of what it's going to take. I personally find it very difficult to believe that you're going to have 12 jurors come to a unanimous verdict for guilty or not guilty. I think there's so much involved in this case that it's going to be a, could be a split jury. It could be a hung jury. Uh, nevertheless, if they do reach a verdict, it's going to take quite a while to go ahead and reach a verdict. There's a lot of evidence to go over. Uh, so I'm going to be curious to see. Um, and I would like to apologize to my Greenville colleague uh, for not recognizing the name right away. But I was sitting here talking to you and I'm trying to think. But of course, I know him and he's a very fine lawyer. So I'd like to uh, offer that apology. So we'll Kim see. Barner. Yeah, Kim. Yeah. yeah. 
Good guy. Uh, and you both are great guys. Thank you so much to uh, Danny Savios and, of course, one of the kings of criminal defense in South Carolina, Jack Swirling. A quick programming note. We are staying on the Alec Murdoch trial all the way to the end, which means we'll be on it all this week. We're still covering the uh, hellacious murders, the quadruple homicides, and uh, any breaking news on that will be on it. And, of course, on Friday, we're back live with your true crime with Phil and Gil. Love you, America.